بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name by the permission and blessings of our Creator Lord and Creator of all the worlds Our best salutations to our beloved leader Muhammad to his pious family, descendants and companions We pray our Creator to grant them his utmost mercy as well as all previous prophets and messengers who preceded them, especially our beloved Jesus and Moses. Peace be upon them all. The companion, Amr ibn al-Khattab, narrated that the prophet said, actions meaning their validity and acceptance in the sight of our Creator, actions are but by intentions and each person gets but what he intended so whoever's migration is to Allah and his Prophet then his migration is to Allah and his Prophet and whoever's migration is for worldly goal to attain or a woman to marry then his migration is to what he migrated for this is an authentic hadith narrated by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. The purpose of mentioning this hadith usually from the writer is to remind himself and to ask Allah, pray Allah, to provide him with a sincere intention in his action to come. It's also a reminder to the listener or the reader that he will also get what he intended in a way or another. A person reading a book or watching a lecture with the intention of attacking and disfiguring a religion or a person may be able to get a lot of rhetoric just like a paranoia is able to provide a lot of rhetoric about his ideas which nonetheless are wrong. A person seeking the truth will find it with the mercy of Allah. A person feeling he knows the truth but wanting to get more comfort from Allah, more guidance, more spiritual illumination by the grace of Allah will also get it whether he watches this or similar lectures or whether he just walks down the street and looks around him with reason. When we need to know more about a subject, who do we ask? In here, we're concerned with Islam. This is our subject. Islam, by the founder of Islam, our prophet, under revelation from our creator, is a way of life. In order to know about a way of life, do we ask people who know it and lived it, or people with just a Muslim passport, or a Jewish or a Christian passport, or people with an ulterior motive, an ulterior plan, a political agenda, a religious agenda against that specific way of life? Which person, which type of person do we need to, to ask? People who really need to know about this religion, which states that it's a way of life, need therefore to ask about it from people who applied it, who lived it, according to its rules. Such people would include the most prominent people of this religion and also the masses who applied it correctly. We need apply that religion, not applied a deformation of that religion. Whatever religion it may be, in whatever century it may be, there will be deformations. Are we gonna, if we need 
to know about a specific religion, this is different than needing to know about people who have uh, that religion's passport or who say they uh, follow that religion. Our purpose is to present the religion of Islam, the ideal that our Prophet presented to humanity. An ideal for people is normally not attainable 100%. This should be, in our mind, any person who has, who wants to challenge this is welcome to provide us with his ideal in the way he is able to implement it totally. Provided this idea is a little complicated. We're not asking about a simplistic ideal that I will never kill. Everybody is able to conform to that. But present a way of life that has challenges as an ideal, normally people may not be able to conform 100% to it. This ideal also will be as stated by its messenger, not as stated, disfigured, altered by another person who came after him. This is why Muslims are very keen on referring to the text of the Quran, to the text of the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet, then to the explanations of the companions. But the reference point is not the companions, is not the scholars. They're all providing their interpretation of the Quran and the text of the Hadith according to the, their scholastic abilities, which are all, have always been open to discussion by other scholars, and left to the mind and the rationality of the listener, depending on his ability to critique or not. Islam is established according to the texts of the Quran and the Hadith, and the actions of the Prophet, as we just mentioned. In here, we mention an example from politics. Referring to a Security Council resolution uh, concerning the Israeli-Arab war, or some of the wars, that stated withdraw withdrawal from lands. I remember, and many would remember, discussions that it means this, this withdrawal from lands and not from the lands. This is a human text. It's used as a reference, and it's somewhat dissected. Every word counts with a serious document. The same applies to, to most legal, legal contracts and documents. Every word counts. You dissect it. Authoritative textbooks of science and law are also dissected, unless proven wrong. Then this book is not an authority anymore. The Muslims' reference, again, are the Holy Quran, the words and the actions of the Prophet. Muslims have dissected them like any respectable body does with its own text. They dissected them to establish the aim of the text, what it can imply, what it cannot imply, where does it apply, where it does not apply. The second point we need to mention is so obvious to Muslims and so unknown to others unless they read about Islam. It concerns the Arabic word isnad, which is the credentials that Muslim scholars accept between them when relating a happening or a quotation. When we're looking to a TV discussion, we might see a person called an Islamic thinker or a critic or a philosopher. What's his identity? What are his backgrounds? Normally we know very little. In contrast, Islam, based on tradition, is based on tradition, sorry. 
the tradition of the Prophet, of the successors, and the eminent scholars. That doesn't mean the tradition on how to perform and how to apply technological details of our life. The tradition meant here concerns issues of religion. As thus, tradition is definite concerning the credentials to be accepted for narrating a fact, for accepting somebody's words. These are permissions that are granted verbally or in writing in these centuries. They're granted verbally or in writing by a teacher who was also granted that permission verbally or in writing by his teacher, etc., to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Such permissions are usually to perform legislation or just to narrate. This is somewhat similar to contemporary certificates from accredited bodies. Except that Muslim scholars include an additional criteria, which is a requirement of a continuous chain between the person narrating the issue to the person, the source of the words. Normally, we're talking the source here is the Prophet. Concerning this issue of Isnad, of the authority of the relaying the story through a chain of persons, Imam Nawawi, a famous Islamic scholar of the early centuries, wrote in his introduction to his commentary on Sahih Muslim. I'm selecting some of his paragraph, some parts of his paragraph. Praise be to Allah who singled out this nation with the science of Isnad, which is referencing. He continues, with the science of referencing, which has not been shared by any of the other nations. And praise be to Allah, who also established for this purified and noble sunnah, which is the tradition of the Prophet, the most elect among the memorizers and critics of hadith, who protected it, who protected it across the ages and countries, doing their best to point out its correct chains and the incorrect ones in order to protect it from decrease or augmentation, meaning to keep the text as it was, let alone deformation, as happened with other religions through the centuries and ages. Our nation, uh, this is the end of Imam Nawawi's, uh, of the translation from Imam Nawawi's words. So our nation has been blessed by this gift and honor, which continues to this century. From the previous century and to the future, with an uninterrupted chain of teachers and narrators up to the Prophet ﷺ. Individuals who receive this permission also find in it spiritual light. This is a subjective issue. This is not a rational issue to prove. It's something stated. Um, if you take a paper from a beloved person, it means a lot to you. For a Muslim scholar, receiving such a permission connected to the Prophet, peace be upon him, is felt with a spiritual light. In the Quran, Allah states, O Prophet, we have sent you as a witness, a bearer of good tidings, and a warner, as one and one who invites to Allah by his leave, and as a lamp spreading light. This light is spiritual. The companions who met the Prophet did see and describe the spiritual light 
people who met them in a, if you want to call it telepathic way, would be able to feel as a, some type of a reflection, this spiritual light and so on to the person at the end of the chain. Again, this is a subjective issue. It has no bearing on proving an issue or not. It is a dear issue to people who love Islam. The current speaker has been blessed to have listened across several years to Sheikh Mahmoud Rankusi in Dar al-Hadith in Damascus, Syria, and has been granted his permission in addition to permissions by other great Islamic scholars. Uh, usually permissions are granted verbally, but the majority are granted in writing. Um, uh, the edge of this frame uh, is a sample of one of the permissions. As mentioned by Imam Nawawi, Islamic scholars have specialized in critiquing various chains of isnad, of authentication, in order to classify the acceptability of hadith. This has resulted, since the early centuries of Islam, in a unique science methodology of authentication, based on rational criteria which happens to be the most solid science to decide the authenticity of happenings, of narrations, of what somebody, what of news. We'll cite some of the pillars of this methodology. Truthfulness of the person is a condition. Having ever lied, makes the person a weak narrator. So, if this hadith exists with one weak narrator in the chain, it's not immediately rejected, but it's not accepted in order to deduce legislation and important matters in religions. In order for that to happen, it needs an other, at least one other or more corroborating narration from another chain that doesn't share that person. If it's weak, it may be used for spiritual advice, for spiritual encouragement. It cannot be used for deducing and for um, in course of law, up trying to apply the Islamic Sharia. Another condition is the level of knowledge of the person the initial person in the field of question, in question. For example, two Muslim scholars were discussing one action, how did the Prophet prescribe it? One scholar mentioned his chain, another scholar mentioned another chain. One of them mentioned to the other, but the companion that I'm quoting is knowledgeable in this subject. I'm summarizing, simplifying. So what's important is you will accept the narration if the person is not very knowledgeable, but that narration will be overruled by the narration of a person who's knowledgeable if there's any difference. Another important aspect is memory. A person who's forgetful whose memory is not impeccable. By the way, most of the uh, companions who narrated used to be able to memorize in one stream or two or three by listening once or twice. The, their life was, was based on that. Give them a calculator, teach them how to use it. They will take a long time to get to your level in being able to use a calculator or a computer. Their life was based on the ability to memorize. That faculty gets much more, gets strengthened by need. We all know these things. Another issue that affects the credibility of a narrator 
is his affiliation. If this narration touches on some issue, the partisanship of this person will come into play. The very simplified uh, example here is in the court of law, the testimony of a father or a brother would not be accepted because of the relationship. Another condition in the uh, science of authentication in Islam re rests on having met the people he narrated from. How does that happen? Well, if uh, one other person is in a chain, is narrating from another person, and it so says it later from another source that he died before or after where their dates of death and birth don't coincide, he physically couldn't have met him. It means this person is dropping a person and not saying him. That makes it a weak narration. Another issue is this person is narrating, he lived with him, he was a contemporary, but this person was in Morocco, the other person was in Egypt, and we know that neither traveled. In here, there is a problem whereby probably he's dropping a person. Now, why would it matter that he's dropping a person? Because when a person is dropped, we can't verify the above conditions. Was he a liar? Was he a partisan? Was he a falsifier of hadith? Yes, there have been falsifiers. They have been weeded out. Manuals, descriptions. The final outstanding issue concerns the hadith to be used for deducing legislation. In order to deduce legislation, many among the Islamic scholars would not accept a single authentic hadith. The more serious the matter is, then an additional hadith from a different chain is required. For Imam Abu Hanifa, for example. This was just a synopsis of the rationality of accepting hadith. This is the foundation of Islamic thought. It has to be mentioned. Sorry for going into that. But we find that an unbiased rational comparison with other historical narrations, religious narrations from other religions, the weakest hadith in the Islamic tradition excluding falsified hadith. A falsified hadith is falsified, so it's not a hadith anymore. But any of the hadith that would qualify, as stated above, as a weak hadith, remains stronger than any version of any other of the holy books available, available to humanity. The impartial listener is requested to ponder a little about this. The statement that I just said is either false or true. It's not open to partisanship if you don't like it. By the way, this lecture is directed to people seeking the truth, to people feeling a void must be filled. Other people may listen to this lecture with other purposes. This is not who we are addressing now. We give the example of the New Testament, for example. Would anybody in court be accepted to provide a testimony? Oh, well, we got the testimony of John, Mark, Luke. So we're talking about person conveying a way of life, stating that it is for humanity. Neither testimony would be acceptable in a court of law based on the identity of the person. The identity is not known. Sir, 
Your Honor, the judge, Mark told me this. No court of law would accept that. None of them met Jesus. So first, we don't know their names. We don't know their ethics. Sorry. Muslims need to know the ethics of every person in the chain until it, the, the books were written. Sorry, it's important. It's not a game. None of the persons met Jesus. And yet, different manuscripts came up around a century or more after, maybe less, sorry, 60 years, written definitely by people who did not meet Jesus. So that's not first-hand information. Again, as mentioned above, we have absolutely no details on their personalities, their truthfulness, their affiliations, their partisanship, except for Paul. But what we know about Paul is that he was not in good terms with the closest of the disciples of Jesus when he started, until he got the upper hand. That's important. In, for any way of thought or for any um, re system of, of thinking, a person coming in and being resisted by the followers of the founder, that raises a big question mark on the person. So it is very um, informative to realize, to review in our minds that none of the writers of the New Testament are known except Paul, who according to many authorities in the Western world, is the founder of Christianity. And that will come in other lectures. Christianity today is not the Christianity that Jesus, peace be upon him, taught. It is what Paul has, we say, deformed. The versions of the New Testament and the writers of the New Testament do not provide any details about their sources, how they got it. In comparison, picking any hadith, normally when we mention a hadith like we mentioned it in the beginning of this lecture, we go down to the, to the meat of the hadith, which is called the um, metin, the quote. But in all books of hadith, all the chain is mentioned, and within the chain, how the person, how the companion heard it from the Prophet. Sometimes he would say, the Prophet stretched his hand, shook my hand, held it, said so and so. We will see soon. Some examples brought, not because of that. So here, how was this specific narration heard? And then how was it relayed? So, these details that we just noticed that we know about the New Testament of the great prophet Jesus with a great message to mankind, these weaknesses by Muslim scholars and by any rational thinking person who wants the truth are called darknesses piled upon darknesses. You would not pay $10 if I brought you a story based on such weak chain of narrations, therefore give me ten dollars, I'm going downtown to pay your bill. You will not accept to do that. In summary, no such texts are admissible in any human court. This is why a lot of people in the Western world have become atheists. On this point, they are logical. On the other points, it's a sorrow. The message of Jesus and the message of the Old Testament are the message of life. They contain the guidance for man at their time. 
the intention of God to preserve a message was declared when the Prophet Muhammad was declared. Before that, humanity was not able to protect a message. None of the body books mentioned that this text will be available, unchanged. The words of God will not change. But none said that this text, by the way, the Bible, the word the Bible, is not in the Old Testament. So that God would say, this Bible will be preserved. A very important thought I uh, listened to in one of the videos from a Western scholar who has, uh, was raising, raising that issue here. He says, when God sends a message for us to follow with his ability, it is only, it only makes sense that this message should be preserved. Now, the person was not saying that um, his intention was somehow he wanted to come up with a way to find the truth, to weed out the truth. This, my words are not to mean that therefore, since these books changed, they are not the word of God, no. These are the words of God, they contain the word of God, they were meant for the people of that age, and our Creator mentions in the Quran that for each nation a messenger has been sent. That covers the question of if God wants me to follow a message, he should deliver it to me complete. There are periods mentioned in Islam or in, mentioned by in the Quran and by our Prophet, period of inactivity among Prophets, especially between Jesus and Muhammad, the Islamic thinking and verdict is such people are not responsible for what they didn't know. It's mentioned in the Quran, it's very clear. The above words are not to demean the other holy books, they're just to mention a rational fact. An additional advantage that the Muslims have with this issue of isnad, authenticity, the chain of narration, is the advantage of maintaining the same language. So, in addition to knowing the personality, knowing how it happened exactly, not missing one person in the chain, knowing the truthfulness, knowing the morality, knowing everything, we have the word by word of the Quran to the letter of the Hadith, many of the Hadith are also exact to the letter. Some of them are narrated by meaning, which is acceptable if the narrator is an authority in the field. So the issue of language is very, very, very important. Wouldn't you love to know the language of Jesus? And wouldn't you love to hear the same words as he said them? We have that from our beloved Prophet, 